Okay, hello everyone. My name's Steve uh, from Table Tennis North. I'm currently in the amazing lands of the Northwest Territories today. And I'd like to welcome you once again to another session working with the team at the Richmond Oval. Uh, we're going to be discussing nutrition for athletes today. And I'm going to hand you over straight away to Cassidy, who's going to take you to the next person who's going to give you all the information that you need about nutrition. Take care. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Table Tennis North, uh, here today. Um, so, oh, I might be cutting out here a little bit. Not sure. Okay. Anyways, so here I'm going to pass this on to Rochelle very quickly here, so that I don't get lost um, with my internet connection. But Rochelle uh, has joined our team at the Richmond Olympic Oval very recently. She is a registered dietitian um, with British Columbia at the College of Dietitians of British Columbia. She has a bachelor's of food nutrition and, health, and a health degree in majoring in diet, dietetics. Ooh, can't say that word. Um, she has worked with athletes, general population, supporting um, Olympic athletes and <laughs> the IOC. And she has enrolled in the IOC sport nutrition diploma to elevate her current sport nutrition knowledge. So Rochelle, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Um, really excited to have you guys all here today. Thanks, Rochelle. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction. So hello, everyone. My name is Rochelle. Um, today, I developed a presentation all about nutrition for athletes. So just a couple of foundations of sport nutrition on how we can potentially optimize um, the physical as well as that mental performance in our athletes. So I already had a great introduction. So my name is Rochelle. I'm that dietitian. Um, I love sports nutrition, and that's why I'm here with you today. Before I get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm fortunate to be able to present this initial sports nutrition education session on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. So we're going to dive in to just a brief overview, just to give you a little bit of background of what is a sports dietitian and how can a sports dietitian possibly help your team. So dietitians, they support individuals to reach their nutrition goals, whether that is preventing poor health, improving overall health, or in an athlete's case, optimizing performance and recovery. So I always like to encourage athletes to talk to a dietitian if they have access to one, as they're able to offer support and guidance in making appropriate food choices. So nutritious eating looks different for everyone and our culture, our traditions are also an important part of what we eat and how we eat. So a registered dietitian will be able to meet you where you're at and consider environmental and cultural factors to help different individuals achieve their nutrition related goals. So as I go through our presentation today, I'm going to give you a brief look at what a nutrition education session may look like um, that I give to different sports teams. Um, so here I'm covering just the importance of nutrition. I'm going to talk about just why is good nutrition important for athletes as well as just highlight table tennis as a sport within the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about energy and energy availability. Um, just low energy availability, the signs and symptoms and prevention. And if that's a new term for you, we're also going to really dive into the, that one. Um, then we're going to focus on two specific macronutrients that are extremely important for sport, and that is protein and carbohydrates, the role in athletes' performance, the recommended intakes. I'm going to provide you um, some food examples, including some traditional food examples. And then last, we're going to touch on um, some pre and post workout nutrition guidelines. So I encourage you to not only listen to this session just for education for yourself that I can provide, but hopefully it'll be able to provide you that knowledge so you can apply it to your own lives as well as become a good role model for your athletes. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the presentation, I just encourage you to type it in the chat box. Um, I will kind of give you a few questions here and there just to get you thinking throughout the presentation. So if you want to submit any answers to my questions in the chat box, um, that would be amazing as well. So starting off, just the importance of nutrition. So why is nutrition important for athletes? If you think about all the different reasons on why an athlete is good at their sport, how many would say that nutrition is number one on that list? This may or may not be your first thing that you think of, 
But personally, I think a lot of others, including athletes themselves and coaches, they think of things like talent. They think of motivation, training, trainability, avoiding injury, and there's so much more that are impactful on our performance. However, when we become more elite, those smaller pieces such as nutrition can make significant impacts. And that's why I really like this quote on the screen there is just a good diet um, doesn't make an average athlete elite. However, a poor diet will make an elite athlete average. So it's just finding that last little piece to the puzzle. So as you can see on the screen as well, there's lots of different benefits. Um, so that includes aiding and mental performance, increasing our ability to exercise for longer durations and at higher intensities. It enhances our recovery and making us maintain a healthy immune system, which is going to be extremely important if we want to stay on top of our training schedule. Um, it also supports things like bone health and muscle growth and maintenance. So there's so many different things that nutrition can provide. And that's why it's amazing that you're all here today to learn a little bit more. And then I'm just going to highlight table tennis quickly as a sport. So table tennis, it's a very high intensity and high skills sport. It's necessary to have balance in the entire body as well as speed of reaction time. It requires agility and dexterity as well as um, just that tying into the nutrition, consuming that nutritious and balanced energy sufficient diet may help improve physical indicators and enhance overall health in table tennis athletes athletes. So a recent 2021 research article examined the relationship between consuming a nutritious diet to table tennis athletes training and physical health. And it found that nutritional food can actually improve physical indicators such as physical function, sports ability, as well as body composition of table tennis players. Um, and it did enhance their overall health. So the first thing we're going to dive into briefly is just energy balance. So if you'd like to submit in the chat, um, if you know or don't know of this term, I'm just curious if anyone's ever heard of what energy balance is um, or if they know anything about this one. And as you submit your um, responses, I'm just going to start diving into it. So this is a nice picture on um, this slide, just showing all of the different factors that go into energy balance. So energy balance is that nice balance between how much we consume and how much we expend with lots of other different factors. So overall energy balance is influenced, as you can see, by internal factors such as genetics, our own individual metabolism, hormones, as well as external factors such as environmental, social, behavioral, and cultural. So there's lots of different things and every individual athlete's case is going to be slightly different. And we're going to go into maybe that one side of the equation here. So energy intake. So like I was kind of mentioning, a number of dietary factors can influence our total energy intake. So that could include things like diet composition. So a higher protein diet may actually help us feel fuller for longer. Um, things like eating frequency. So the more frequent we eat, the more likely we are to consume more calories and vice versa. So the less frequent we eat, the less calories. Timing and intensity of exercise. For example, um, this is actually quite unknown, but high intensity exercise may actually start blunting hunger in athletes. So it may be more difficult for them to consume enough energy as well as just the types of foods consumed. So kind of that high and low calorie dense foods, that's really going to make a big overall impact on how much our athletes are fueling each day. So I want you to ask yourself, what dietary factors influence what and how much you eat? And then I kind of want you to start thinking about that. You can submit your responses as well. And then I want you to start tying in that piece of how does this impact your athletes? So how do you think your athletes are either looking at you and what you're eating, or maybe what kind of factors are they facing that influence how much and what they eat? Perfect. And then the second one is I just want to think of any challenges um, that your athletes may face when it comes to fueling properly or enough. And then also just submitting in the chat what those challenges are, and then we can kind of touch on them um, maybe near the end of the presentation, or I can even take a quick look too and see if anyone's putting anything in. Perfect. So we're good so far, but I just want you to start thinking there. All right, so the other side of the equation here is energy expenditure. 
So same as energy intake, there's a number of factors influencing our energy expenditure. Again, that includes diet composition. So this is something called the thermic effect of food. So depending on how much protein, how much fat, and actually how much overall food we consume, we use calories to digest and absorb these nutrients. So the second thing is intensity and frequency of exercise. So a higher intensity and frequency and duration is going to result in a higher energy expenditure. And then another one is factors influencing resting met metabolic rate. So things like gender, muscle mass, height, all those different things are going to impact each individual a little bit differently. So someone may have a completely higher metabolism than someone else just due to those factors like male versus female, more muscle mass, less muscle mass, and so on. So all of these factors are variable and they change daily and they have underlying metabolic controls that work to regulate energy balance. So it's really interesting. It's not as simple as eating less, moving more. I know that seems very common, but our bodies really want to stay at that nice level where we feel happy. So if we notice maybe that we are consuming less energy for long durations of time, our body is actually going to naturally change lots of little different factors to try to decrease our expenditure, whether that be our physical expenditure or energy that's getting put into our immune system, for instance. So that's what brings me into the next piece, which is going to be talking about energy availability. However, I'm just gonna quickly pause here to make sure that there isn't any questions at all. Perfect, so so far, so good. So that brings me on to our next slide here, which is energy availability. So again, I'm very curious if anyone's ever heard of the term energy availability before, or maybe know what it is. I'm gonna briefly go over some definitions for you. So the first one is energy availability. It's the number of calories left over for those basic physiological functioning after accounting for energy used in our training. So a good example of this is if you burn or if your athlete has burned 1500 calories and ate 2100 calories, that means that that athlete only has 600 calories left for the rest of their body to be put into different systems. So if that number is too small, by the end of the day, you place your body in a state of low energy availability. And as you can see on the screen, the definition of low energy availability is that number of calories left over for those basic functions. So I love to bring this up because this is something important for you as a coach to just be aware of as well, as it can have multiple impacts on your athlete's overall health and performance. So if low energy availability persists, your body is going to start shutting things down that aren't super important for that specific day. Some examples of that include um, decreased bone remodeling, things like decreased ability to recover your muscle after training, as well as decreased production of reproductive hormones. So for female athletes, if they go extreme long durations of low energy availability, they can actually start losing their period. So it's just something to be mindful of. I'm going to pose another question. Feel free to submit something in the chat or just start thinking about it. But does anyone know how low energy availability or just not eating enough may impact your athlete's performance? Just want you to start thinking about this and I'll see if anyone submits things in the chat. Slow recovery, good. Yeah, and I see a question here. Can you talk about low versus high resting heart rate and energy? Um, I will be going into um, a little bit about um, the types of energy that we use based off of our exercise. So maybe I'll touch on it a little bit then. Yeah, and I also see mental fatigue. That's excellent. Yeah, so a couple that I wrote down is loss of muscle and strength loss of training time because of illness or injury, things like reduced endurance capacity, inability to produce peak power, slower reaction time and tougher time concentrating, which is probably going to be especially important in table tennis when you have to focus so hard, things like low mood or reduced training adaptation. So yes, as a coach, these are really good things to be aware of. If you think um, you may have an athlete that may be in or at risk of low energy availability, availability, 
that is actually when I maybe recommend that you potentially address some questions first with the athlete, or you can observe from afar um, just to further see if this is going to be a problem. So I'm going into a next slide here of a bunch of different questions you as a coach can start thinking of when you think about every individual athlete that you coach. So asking your athletes to write out everything that they eat and how much energy they expend can be quite tedious process. Even me as a dietitian, there's so many different things that can come into play with that. So if you are wondering if this applies to your own athletes on whether they're eating enough, you can definitely save this slide and just start thinking about every single one of these questions. I like to focus more so on how athletes are feeling throughout the day and how it's impacting their performance. So if your athletes can answer yes to most of these questions, they're likely doing pretty well. However, if they are answering no to most of these questions, that's when it may be more appropriate for a dietitian to come in. So referring them to maybe a sports dietitian such as myself for more one-on-one -on -one assistance may be beneficial for this athlete, depending on each case. So another question, does anyone have any strategies they want to share that may ensure that their team is eating enough overall? And again, I'll keep listing off all of my suggestions as you submit your own. So the tips that I typically like to share with athletes um, is incorporating more calorie dense foods. That's a super easy um, intervention here. So things like trail mix, cooking with olive oil or any type of oil, um, typically fat and protein rich foods are going to be great sources of calorie dense um, items and always have food on hand. So just think about packing different snacks, suggesting this to your athletes. Maybe if you're going on a tournament, just always having those things on hand. I see a couple of things coming in the snack. Um, in the chat, meal listed in our daily schedules during tournaments. Yeah, snack bags, great. Yeah, and also suggesting to your athlete, like if your athlete only fuels maybe three times a day, suggesting just adding in a couple snacks in between the meals can be another really easy way to increase the calories. Another thing that I like to think of is if the barrier to eating enough um, as an athlete, if your athlete comes to you and they are just feeling way too full all the time um, and they're just finding it a difficult time, like stomaching enough calories for their expenditure, I like to tell them to actually opt for lower fiber foods. So an example of that can be swapping like a high fiber um, bread and going for like a lower fiber white toast um, or even consuming calories through liquid form. So um, in comparison to solids, liquids actually digest quite fast. So things like smoothies, juices, milks, um, those are going to leave the stomach a lot faster, making your athlete feel um, not as full after consuming them. Let's see, how do you address and talk to athletes when they ask about burning calories? How do you address and talk to athletes when they ask about burning calories? Um, Cassidy, if you could kind of um, ex or expand that question a little bit more in terms of um, burning calories, I would love that a little bit. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I just, this came up last night exactly. So I have a lot of athletes who actually they use um, Fitbits or step trackers, which I myself, I'm not like a fan of. Um, if they're talking about steps, sure, fine, cool. But recently they started asking about is, is burning 250 calories good? Mm. And I'm like, uh, mm -hmm. as long and as, as long as you're taking in enough, I, I don't really care, but how mm -hmm. would you, as, um, somebody who has that, ex who has the knowledge, how would you address it? That's a really, really <laughs> good there, question. Are there any red flags about that kind of question? Mm -hmm. And again, that's a really, really great question. I think, um, especially within sport and athletes, um, there can be, quite a fine line between performance and caring about your nutrition and then kind of looking too far into how much am I expending? How much am I consuming? And I think that the red flag comes in when you kind of look over these questions, you're noticing like impaired performance, they're, they're really dialed in on specifics. Um, it can kind of be more around um, disordered eating tendencies or kind of that addiction to like exercise and expending calories. So when athletes and other clients that are maybe just 
active individuals come to me and they start addressing like how many calories they're burning and how much they should feel and all of that sort of thing. I just like to bring it back to talking more so about what their goals are, you know, like bringing it back away from the numbers and be like, so if they come to me saying that exact question, like is burning to 50 calories good? Kind of want to say, um, what is your goal within the session? You know, bring it back to the performance. Like, did you feel good in that session? Like, did you feel like that you lift, lift more weight or you were able to push a little bit harder? Did that session feel good to you? Um, and kind of take away from the numbers. But again, every individual case is going to be a little bit different. And if you are, as a coach, starting to notice maybe your athlete is addressing lots of these kind of questions that may be posing red flags, that's almost when I would suggest having that dietitian come in because it could be a lot deeper than um, just that simple questionnaire. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that question. It's great. Okay. So we talked a lot about energy and energy availability and all that sort of thing. And definitely like after leaving those slides, consider exactly what Cassidy mentioned, just like every individual athlete, if everyone's overall looking pretty good, um, but then you notice a few individuals with a couple of those red flags, maybe they're answering no to a lot of those questions. That's definitely when you should start thinking about referring to that dietitian for more specialized care. Um, so the next part is protein. So why is protein important for athletes? There's lots of different things. So with protein synthesis, um, that's one of the main ones that we like to think about. So we think about the muscle. So this is especially important when you're an athlete, as we are constantly tearing and rebuilding our muscle. The second is bone. So the combination of exercise and sufficient protein intake not only provides performance benefits, but early prevention of bone disease, such as osteoporosis. And then connective tissue. So healthy connective tissue helps prevent certain severe and or frequent sports related injuries. And then lastly, it creates enzymes and other protein molecules. So those are really important for biochemical reactions that aid different bodily functions, such as digestion, energy production, blood clotting, muscle contraction. So lots of different things there as well as that last little piece of satiety and feeling of fullness. So protein really helps us feel more full by slowing down the digestion of food, therefore keeping our food in our stomach a little bit longer. So with this slide, it kind of compares um, that average human who isn't very active to an athlete, just to give you some perspective here. So an average person, the recommended amount of food or protein that they should be having is around 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. However, if you look at an athlete who's very active per day, that nearly doubles um, or more so doubles. So that's 1.7 to two grams per kilogram per day. So again, you don't have to think of very specifics, but just knowing that the amount of protein that an athlete needs is substantially more. A number of reviews and position, position stands have concluded that a higher protein intake is required for athletes. So you may be wondering, like, how much protein per feeding? So that anabolic effect of dietary protein can be observed at the equivalent of about 10 grams of protein, and that's both after resistance and aerobic-based training. Um, however, with an athlete, their goal is typically to like maximize um, that muscle protein synthesis. So I wouldn't ever maybe recommend around 10. That would be more so for that average person. I would want an athlete to have a little bit more and that's somewhere around that 20 to 30 grams of protein, specifically a high quality protein, because that is going to be more sufficient to maximally stimulate that muscle protein synthesis. So as you can see in this graph, um, I really love this graph because it shows you that muscle protein synthesis based off of how much protein you're consuming. So as you can see, zero grams of protein, low, 10 grams of protein, we're increasing that muscle synthesis, 20 grams of protein, even higher. But the interesting part of this graph is that doubling that protein intake to that 40 grams has no further effect on muscle protein synthesis. And this specific study is in um, average weight, so 80 kilogram um, young men, but it's similar 
quite across the board there. Um, so this is just showing us that even if we double the amount of protein, we're having a very similar response to our muscle building. So why is this important? Like if an athlete comes to you and maybe they have educated themselves that they know that they should be having a lot of protein and they say, oh yeah, for dinner, um, I had a big steak providing me like 60 grams of protein, like I'm going to build some muscle. Maybe that's kind of when, even if you think about it, that's quite expensive diet to follow to a high protein diet can be quite expensive. So by hitting just more so around that 20 or 30 grams, they're going to be having a similar muscle response. Now you may be wondering, so if we're not using all of that protein for muscle building, where does it, tip, where does it go? Um, we will just break that extra protein down into um, smaller molecules, and those are called amino acids, and those will be made um, into energy for our bodies. So it'll be converted by our metabolism to be used for energy, or we'll just excrete it through our urine. So yeah, the optimal protein intake, somewhere around that 20 to 30, but if you want to be more specific, um, it's around... Um, 0.3 grams per kilogram minimum um, per meal or snack, or up to 0.5 grams per kilogram. And again, that's just more specifics. And I'm going to dive into what that looks like in food because numbers can be quite difficult to follow there. Then in this next graph, um, it's just kind of talking about more protein timing. So when it comes to protein, I also really, I, I don't just recommend having enough protein, but I also recommend having it in um, a good format throughout your day. So I really try to push having athletes have at least four to six meals per day containing that good source of protein. And this is just because it helps us absorb it most efficiently throughout the day. Um, and again, why is this important? So if an athlete comes to you and maybe their goal is to increase their strength and they're not really noticing um, many results or they're not noticing um, the benefits of the protein, it may be worthwhile kind of looking at and asking them questions. Do you have protein at breakfast? Do you have protein at lunch? Do you have protein at dinner? What does that look like? Just to get a good idea that they are spreading out their protein quite evenly, because that's going to be most effective for that muscle synthesis there. So what are good sources of protein? I'm gonna to quickly ta touch on um, different sources um, just to educate yourselves on what that kind of looks like. And then we're gonna look at what a 20 gram serving looks like. So lots of different sources of protein. Um, it's important to understand just these foods, just because we can, again, educate your athletes about those different protein rich foods and how they can incorporate that into their diet. So there's white meat, so more leaner meats. This is typically what I like to recommend most often, as well as those vegetarian sources. So I did include some traditional protein foods as well. So um, grouse, um, we have some rabbit, duck, and then like chicky, ch chicky, chicken and turkey. And then those vegetarian sources are gonna be things like those dairy products, eggs, um, legumes, lentils, soy, nuts and seeds. Um, and then also making sure that we have some marine um, protein sources in there. Um, lots of great nutrients found in things like salmon, like omega-3s, which we aren't touching on um, specifically in this presentation, but there has been shown lots of benefits to those for athletes. And then some red meat as well. So what does that look like? So if, again, you have an athlete, maybe you're going traveling with them and you see that they pack themselves a lunch. You can kind of briefly just take a peek and kind of see how much protein maybe they are having in that meal. So a good way to kind of generally know how much um, 20 grams of protein looks like is any kind of palm sized cooked meat. So if you take out your hand and look at the size of your palm, as well as the thickness, that's going to be roughly 20 grams of protein right there. Um, another thing is like just a small can of tuna, maybe two cups of cow or soy milk. Um, that's also about like two and a half ounces of hard cheese, um, three fourth cup of Greek yogurt, a cup and a half of legumes, three large eggs, and three fourths cups of nuts and seeds. Again, I kind of want to recommend too that there's lots of variety within the diet. So we would never want to say to our athletes to 
um, go for maybe a third, uh, three fourths of a cup of nuts and seeds for their main protein source. Um, however, it's really good to know that that does contain protein there. So as a role model too, um, it's important to know what our um, protein is coming from. So if you're having a meal yourself, maybe you can use that as an opportunity to include some protein. Your athletes are around you, you're eating your meal, and then you can just use that as an opportunity to just share the benefits of protein for athletes and maybe show them how you incorporated it into your diet. Are there any questions about protein before I move on to anything else there? Okay, perfect. So next we're gonna move on to the second important macronutrient and that is carbohydrates. So does anyone know how our body gets energy from carbohydrates? You can submit it in the chat or I'll let you think about it. Then I'll just kind of go into it. <laughs> so we like to break it down into single sugars to use it immediately. Oh, let's see, someone submitted something. Yeah, use as sugar slash energy. Exactly, that's perfect. We break it down into those single sugars and we can either use that immediately um, in our blood sugar or we actually store carbohydrates in our muscles as um, glycogen. So what glycogen is, is a chain of those sugars and then we can grab it from that my muscle store and then break it down into those single sugars it's whenever... our blood glucose levels. So it helps prevent our athletes from maybe feeling really lightheaded or nauseous or fatigued during exercise. So that's even a great indication um, if you're with your athletes while they're training and maybe a couple athletes um, are just like feeling really lightheaded or they're feeling a little bit nauseous. It may not be due to the fact that the exercise is extremely intense, but maybe they just didn't feel properly beforehand. Um, so that's a great thing to kind of think about. Maybe have having even some carbohydrate rich snacks on you to provide to your athletes during training. Um, the second is those glycogen stores. It spares those glycogen stores and helps refuel those glycogen stores for future sessions later on, as well as it has central nervous system effects. So it helps keeps our brain sharp by improving our focus and our concentration because carbohydrates are that number one fuel source that our brain just loves. Okay, so I remember someone um, putting into the chat here about like heart rate and energy. So this is sort of related. Um, in the last slide, I mentioned that our body gets energy from glycogen. So it's that chain of sugars. Um, first, I wanna just let you know how much glycogen an athlete actually holds on to just so you have a good idea. So muscle glycogen, again, this can depend on how much muscle your athlete is carrying, but it can hold up to 300 to 400 grams, or that's equivalent to 1200 to 1600 calories worth of carbohydrates and energy in our muscles. Um, liver glycogen, so our liver actually holds on to sugars as well. That's more so around that 300 to 400 calories worth of carbohydrates. And then our blood glucose, so our blood sugar, that's more so around 100 calories. So back to that question. What we use, um, whether that's carbohydrate or fat, is determined on that intensity of exercise. So as you can see on this slide here, you can kind of see as intensity increases, um, we're going to use more carbohydrate. Um, and as intensity decreases, we actually use a little bit less carbohydrate. Um, so our recommendations based off of our training for carbohydrate might have to be adjusted either up or down. And we're going to actually touch on that in our next few slides and, and put this into like a practical sense that you're able to maybe translate to your athletes. So um, I found a 2018 review uh, about table tennis athletes specifically. And it noted that success in table tennis requires the capability to perform high intensity efforts, rapidly recover between rallies and matches, and maintain cognitive function. And that carbohydrate intake before playing table tennis might have a positive effect on all of those indicators there. 
So um, what is the recommended carbohydrate intake? First, I'm going to talk more so around numbers, and then we're going to put it into a balanced plate format because I find the balanced plate format is a lot easier for many athletes as well as coaches to understand and fully adapt. Um, so first, with those numbers, I recommend a minimum of 55% of total energy intake um, coming from carbohydrates just for those racket sport athletes. And then you can be even more specific um, and recommend six to 10 grams per kilogram of body mass per day. So what does that look like in food? Because numbers are one thing, but it's great to translate it to make sure we understand what that even looks like. So I used an 80 kilogram athlete for this example, and that's 480 to 800 grams of carbohydrates. And I know that sounds crazy. Um, and again, this is all dependent on your athlete's um, expenditure, intensity, training frequency, et cetera. But what does 480 grams of carbohydrates look like? So on the side, I provided a bunch of different examples. So that would be for breakfast. They would have a cup of oatmeal, a quarter cup of raisins, and two tablespoons of maple syrup. A snack could be an energy bar, such as like a Cliff bar, and a 20-ounce bottle of Gatorade. Lunch could include a large tortilla, a cup of black beans, and a cup of cooked rice, or maybe like a burrito or burrito bowl. And the snack, a large banana, three dates, and then dinner, two cups of cooked spaghetti. So that would all together add up to that 480 grams of carbohydrates. But again, numbers and all those things, I it depends on the athlete and um kind of the experience of the athlete and what their goals are, but I really love these next slides here. And this is just talking about balanced plates. Um, it's a great way of thinking about how many carbohydrates you should be consuming. So this method is easier for coaches to use, not only to educate your athletes, but examine what their plates may look like, especially when traveling and you see their plates when you're um, out and about. So this is an example of what your athlete's plate may look like on a easy training day or maybe a rest day. So this is also a typical balanced plate that's recommended to just the general public. Um, if you are familiar with the Canada's food guide, this looks very similar to that, whereas half that plate is fruit or vegetables. And those last two quarters are split evenly between carbohydrates and protein. Okay. So this is like that easy training, like rest day, but as we move on to increasing maybe our exercise, this is an example of what moderate training looks like. So I want you to note the differences between that last plate. So as you can see, that vegetable portion has slightly decreased from that half plate to only a third cup or a third plate. Whereas that starchy carbohydrate portion has increased from that quarter plate to about that third of a plate. So it also includes that side of fruit, as you can see, um, just because that adds an additional serving of carbohydrates. So if your athletes were going to have a hard training session, does anyone have any ideas on what their plate may look like? So this is for that moderate training, but there is still a next step. This could be like for a double session day. Does anyone know how this one is going to adapt to an even more intense training day? You can add that into the chat. Like what part of the plate would we want to either decrease or increase? I see more protein. Yeah. Good. Anyone else? Okay. I'm going to dive into, oh, do we have another one? Less vegetables. Good. Yeah. Perfect. So if we moved on to a hard training day. Um, I love that piece that you said there with that less vegetables, so many different reasons on why we actually increase mostly those carbohydrates. Um, so we go from like that third plate of carbs to a full half of carbs. We basically swap out that vegetable intake for that carb intake. So the vegetable portion is just to that um, quarter cup there, whereas the starchy carbs are half the plate. And as you can notice that protein stays the same. And again, that's just because the protein content 
we want to keep it consistent around that 20 to 30 grams because that's all as much we can put towards our muscle building. But the main focus of all of these different balance plates as we go through is just noticing that carbohydrates are what we are using to fuel that training and to fuel our recovery. Um, so this is a really great example. I really love um, looking at balance plates um, in terms of seeing just how much our athletes are fueling. Eggs Benny for breakfast. Now that sounds delicious. <laughs> Definitely. Sorry, what, what's that um, brown thing beside the toast in the grain section? The brown thing beside the toast in the, the round. The round thing is that rice or it's, it's, it looks like a patty of some sort. Yeah, I th on the right side of the toast. Yes. Yes, that that's just like a pile of some rice there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no worries. And going back to that one comment that someone said about decreasing vegetables, that is also something that I want to highlight as well is as we um, are thinking about hard training, we may actually want to decrease the amount of fiber because it's going to keep us feeling um, extremely full if we have lots of fiber, right? And if we want to meet those high carbohydrate needs, um, we're going to get a lot of food in. So by decreasing that fiber, that can really help make sure that our athletes are having enough carbohydrates. Were there any other questions about these athlete plates before I move on to the next slide? I have a question, Rochelle. Mm -hmm. if, uh, first Nia. Um, so when we go to multi-sport events like the Active Winter Games and the Canada Games, we have a gigantic cafeteria available with, uh, I wouldn't say beautiful foods, but definitely not the foods that you might <laughs> have out here and then explaining to the kids saying yeah you shouldn't have those chicken wings so maybe don't have that extra sauce on top of your rice mm -hmm. I think that makes it very hard especially for lower than kids that go to those kind of multi-sport games and that's their way of enjoying those games because it's more about participation rather than performance mm -hmm. I think there's a definitely a fine fine guideline and I, I believe, I mean, there's not really a question. It's just for you, awareness too. It's, um, I think it's building the awareness towards the athletes prior to those games and just say, you know, if you have a competition day, maybe less this and less that, but just, you know, it's it's hard sometimes when we work with our athletes and, and coaches too, for sure. So yeah, yeah. Just in general. yeah, that was a great comment. And going back to what is available, um, that is just like th these bath athlete plates can be using all of those different types of foods. So even like the chicken wings or the sauce, like it's all about just how much we put on your plate of each. So they could still have those chicken wings, you know, like it have about maybe a quarter of a plate. And if it comes with like rice or potatoes, just making sure we're not having like half a plate of chicken Things, a little bit of the rice, especially on those hard training days. Um, and even with those sauces, I know that they're more refined, but I think it's actually a really great way to add in more carbohydrates. So yes, going back to kind of like on those different cafeterias and like the different foods, it's more so educating your athletes on maybe what um, out of all of those different options are coming from carbohydrates. Like what foods are carbohydrate based? What ones have protein? Um, and then again, kind of coming back to those balance plate models, if they aren't training that day, focusing more on that first one, if they are training on that day, but moderately focusing on that second one and so on and so forth. Um, there was one more comment that I wanted to make about just these athlete plates in general um, is not everything is always plated out in a plate format. <laughs> like you could have a wrap or you could have a sandwich. So again, it's just kind of thinking about um, the quantities of each um, and just really at the end of the day, be being mindful of carbohydrates are energy. We should also have protein. So really pushing those carbs on those higher energy days. And that's what actually brings me into the second piece here is fueling for the work required. So we went over all of those different athlete plates, um, but what does that actually even look like? When do we tell our athletes, okay, like we're out of this cafeteria, yeah, this is what your training day looks like. This is what your competition day looks like. How should we form those athlete plates? So um, we want to, this is just an example. I'm not too sure if this is extremely accurate based off of your specific athletes, but based off of what I proposed here, I'm really curious if you guys have a good idea of maybe which days um, would be more important for your athlete to have that higher carbohydrate 
containing plate. Um, and then I also want you to think of the moderate car carbohydrate training plate and as well as that rest plate. And if you either want to take your um, mic off or just submit it in the chat, that would be excellent. So we can start off with which days do we think higher carbohydrates are needed? Okay, let's see here. Yes, great. So uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and then I also saw Cassidy say higher carb Saturday, Sunday. And I really want to touch on that as well, because she's thinking about the next thing that I'm going to say, which is excellent. So yes, like Thorsten said, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, we can see we have those double sessions. We have table training. We have physical training. It's quite intense. So we definitely want to fuel mostly carbohydrates on those days. And then coming back to Cassidy's comment, which I think is excellent, is she mentioned high carb on Saturday and Sunday. And I think what she's thinking of is that term, if you are familiar with it, is carbohydrate loading. So one thing I'd like to note is it's always important to look one day ahead when you think of it. Always think of that work to come. So say if an athlete came to you and they said that they don't really feel hungry, say on like the Sunday, but you know that they have intense training days coming up. So as you can see, Sunday's the rest day, but then Monday they have that double session. So if this athlete comes to you, they're like, yeah, I'm not really hungry. I'm not really eating that much on Sundays, but it's fine because it's my rest day they actually may not be optimizing that energy store in their muscles for that following day. So again, like Cassidy said, maybe we want to encourage this athlete um, to try to have more carbohydrate dense foods on the Sunday and then kind of try to problem solve with them. If their hunger is not really high, let's think about different recipes or different snack options that are going to provide them enough carbohydrate, but maybe they're lower in fiber so they don't feel as full and so on and so forth. Um, does anyone have any questions about that piece? Okay, so the second one is moderate training. So think about, so we just talked about the, the heavy training. So those double session days, does anything um, stand out to you on kind of maybe more of a moderate day? We're recommending more of like a third plate coming from carbohydrates. Does anyone have any ideas on which days those might be? So if you look at the schedule here, here. Yeah. Tuesday, Thursday. Exactly. Yeah. So if you look at the schedule in comparison to Monday and looking at Tuesday, yes, we do have double sessions. However, you can notice that that second session is probably less intense than um, the one on Monday. So in comparison, Monday, we have that physical training as our second session. And then on Tuesday, it's more like skills or mobility, something a lot less intense. However, we're still training twice. So it's going to be more moderate. Um, and then again, um, back to that lower um, training day and those rest days, that Saturday and Sunday, you can either recommend that they have that rest day plate or if you want, you can look ahead and see, okay, are they going to need to optimize their fuel? Maybe more so specifically for competition, or if they're doing anything really intense that Monday, um, they can think about a little bit of ahead and go from that rest plate to having a little bit more carbohydrates. So it is very variable, but the main messaging is carbohydrates are fuel. We should use it to fuel the work we need to um, perform. Okay. And then I guess I have one more question here. Does anyone have any ideas on what they could do with this specific athlete? Um, I know I already mentioned a couple examples, but if they have a low appetite, and this can be throughout any of the day. Um, I've mentioned a couple suggestions, but I'm curious if you had a specific athlete um, just come to you and be like, you know what, coach, like I'm not very hungry this day, but you are noticing that it is reflecting in their performance. What kind of um, suggestions would you offer to them? I have athletes that refuse to eat breakfast. Yeah. And that's a great um, challenge that I get from different clients, different sports teams. <clears throat> and again, it's typically, I'm not too sure about your case, Shona, but um, say if you have like an early morning training session, a lot of athletes may actually just not find it comfortable to have the food sitting in their stomach. And that's where the, what we're going to go into next. Um, so thank you for bringing that one up. 
So that leads me perfectly into this last little part here. Um, I see build in a team practice stack of what you're encouraging. Yes, I love that as well. Um, definitely um, build in a team snack. And even I was going to say, um, this is also a great opportunity to integrate a dietitian into your team, because maybe if they're kind of lacking inspiration or don't know how to make something that's going to work for them, um, you can reach out to me and we can put on a nutrition workshop where we just go through and make like delicious carbohydrate rich snacks. Like I've done little athlete cookies, um, homemade, they're super easy, cost effective, um, and just kind of thinking about all of those different ideas. Perfect. So going into nutrient timing. So nutrient timing is just the application of knowing when to eat, what to eat before, during, and after exercise, just to improve our performance and recovery. So there's pre-workout and there's post-workout. So with pre-training, that goal is to optimize our carbohydrate status in our muscle and our liver. Um, and just to prevent that depletion of total carbohydrate stores in our muscle, um, because that contributes to that fatigue during our exercise. And then for post-training, um, it's all about replenishing that glycogen. So making sure that we get those carbohydrates back into our muscles after we just used a bunch in our training and also to promote some muscle protein synthesis. Okay, so first we're going to dive into our pre-workout guidelines. So again, the goal is to provide the right amount of carbohydrate, fluid, and protein, and that's just to prevent hunger, low blood sugar, and potentially optimize training and performance. So someone mentioned in the chat that some athletes refuse to eat breakfast, and I'm going to pretend that it's maybe because maybe they're just feeling like they don't want food bouncing around in their stomach. Um, and that's why I love this um, simple rule that I'm going to outline for you. So on the screen, I show something called the three, two, one rule. And again, this model is extremely easy to share with your athletes. So this rule shows how you're able to change the composition of your meals, the closer you are to training. So as we get closer to training, we want our meal and snack to be lower in fat, lower in fiber, as this helps our body in many ways, such as digesting those carbohydrates quick enough to use for energy and prevent that stomach discomfort. So the three to one rule, as you can see, there's three hours, two hours, and one hour. So if you have three hours before training, I like to recommend a full meal or large snack containing all three macronutrients. So three hours, three macronutrients. We have carbs, proteins, and fats. And that's again, just because you have that adequate time for your athlete to digest your or their food. Okay. And then when you get down to two, that's just a snack containing carbohydrates and proteins. So in contrast to the three hours, we dropped off that fat because we want this to digest a little bit faster. And then if you only have one hour before training, you may want to recommend to your athlete just to have a simple, small snack of just carbohydrates, um, especially if their main kind of problem or challenge that they're facing is they don't want the feeling of it in their stomach. You can start to brainstorm maybe some um, calorie carb dense foods. So things like um, dates, dried raisins, dried cranberries, dried fruit are an excellent source, any just type of fruit. It could be like a banana, an apple, whatever you have on hand um, that supplies a little bit of carbohydrate. It could even be a toast with jam, um, white toast. So lots of different things you can do here and you can try this out with your athletes. Um, I'm curious, has anyone ever heard of this rule before or maybe have tried to suggest this to their athletes before? And you can put yes or no in the chat. So I say yes, okay, perfect. No, but I love the simplicity. Yeah, yeah, great, okay. Not yet, no, but maybe some of it. Yeah, okay, that's excellent to hear some yes and no's. I really love this guideline because it's very simple, um, but you can go into a little bit more specifics too, if you'd like, I'll just say them to you. But again, just following general guidelines is always great to start. So the carbohydrate quantity of pre-workout typically is around one to four grams per kilogram. Um, so for example, if you had a 70 kilogram athlete, that would look something like two slices of toast, two tablespoons of jam and half a banana. So it seems like a lot of carbohydrates, but again, it's all thinking about 
where we can get that more simple form of carbohydrates so it's not overwhelming to consume. Um, another note is that we wanted to contain some fluid just for extra hydration. So even for that athlete that refuses to eat breakfast um, because it hurts their stomach, um, again, going back to maybe like fluid sources. So things like juice or smoothies, um, because not only does that offer hydration, but it offers like that quick digesting source of um, food there. And the last thing is familiar foods. Um, so you'd never want to recommend to your athlete to maybe eat a banana if they're not used to eating a banana pre-workout, just because you never know what an athlete may respond to um, and how it's going to affect their stomach. So um, I like to trial things maybe during training so they're comfortable. And it's also a little bit of cognitive effect as well. Like familiar foods, they know what they're having. It does a lot of mental gains. So if they're used to having a banana all the time before training, it may actually also help um, improve their performance. So on this one, I just provided some more examples for you all. So as you can see, there's some examples for three hours. That could be like eggs with cheese on toast or like um, a protein like fish with rice and vegetables. Other examples could be like a wrap with chicken. Um, two hours before we're dropping off that fat a little bit, but there's still a little bit of fat like um, the bagel with peanut butter and jelly or like a lower fat yogurt with some fruit. Um, other really easy ones are cereal, whether that's hot or cold, cooked with milk or soy milk, um, cheese and crackers. And then as we drop down to that one hour, you can see it's like pretzels, like a nice simple carbohydrate or dried fruit. Okay, now going into post-workout guidelines. So the goal of those post-workout guidelines is to just provide that amount of carbohydrate, fluid, and protein to help us refuel, rebuild, and rehydrate after training. So fiber is also dependent on the individual. However, it's not necessary. So a lot of questions that I get from different athletes and coaches is, is timing important? And in general, it's nice to eat within that 60 minutes. Um, however, timing becomes a little bit more crucial when you have less time to recover. So for instance, that would look like a double training day. If someone has less than eight hours to recover, so say if they train at 8 to 10 a.m. and then they train again at 2 p.m., that's less than eight hours. So it's going to be really crucial to try to get that athlete to eat some carbohydrates with a little bit of protein around 15 to 30 minutes um, or as soon as they can. So in summary of just that recommendation, the less time to recover, the faster you should get that recovery meal in for your athletes. And again, it goes back to kind of thinking about, okay, so this is important, but how are we going to apply this? So it all goes back to if you're on the road, you're on a trip, knowing that you already have snacks on hand. So if you're in a pinch and you can't find like a place to go eat, you have those snacks on hand, you've prepped some homemade cookies or energy balls or have some pretzels and so on and so forth. I see a couple of things in the chat here. I keep a team Subway and Boston pizza order typed up in my binder for when we need protein carbs. That's amazing. Those two places are easy to find. Yes, and that even brings me back to my um, days when I was a youth athlete. Like I remember Subway and Boston Pizza. Those two specifically were our go-tos. So that's great. Um, athletes' brains are too full to make food decisions. Yes, and that's excellent. I'm so happy to hear that you're thinking about that, Shona, because the athletes, sometimes their main priority is just get on um, to like the court or the gym or whatever they may be training because um, that's what they're thinking about is that they're not thinking about all of these extra factors and so that's why it's important for that coach to really educate themselves know those different sources know those different restaurants different snacks they should have to help support their athletes so recommendations um, if you want to get a little bit more specific for post-workout at least one gram per kilogram of carbs so quite similar to that pre-workout and then for that protein again like I mentioned in the protein section we want to hit that 20 to 30 grams of protein if possible um, so then I just provided like what that may look like so for an 80 kilogram athlete that can look like 
you know, one and a half cups of cooked pasta, third cup of pasta tomato sauce, and a third cup of low fat cheese. So this in itself would provide 80 grams of carbohydrate um, for that 80 kilogram athlete and 24 grams of protein. So if you want to type into the chat, any other ideas for post-workout meals or snacks that they've either suggested or they could suggest to their athletes, that would be excellent. And then we can share it all together. So as I mentioned previously, when we were discussing fuel for the work required, this would be another great opportunity to either have like a group um, nutrition session or workshop, and we can dive into those specific challenges and potential solutions that your athletes may be facing. Sorry, did you say there was a, a time window, an optimum time window within 15 or 20 minutes post-workout? I missed that part if you talked about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so here, I'll go back to, or I actually don't think I have it up on the screen there, but yes, there is. So um, if they are just doing one training session, timing isn't as important, but I do recommend around at least an hour to get some post-workout fuel in. However, if they're either in competition or they have double training sessions and they have then less than eight hours between the two training sessions, that's when you want to try to get something in at least 15 to 30 minutes afterward. And uh, where are you with things like chocolate milk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wait, I think I saw someone say chocolate milk. Yeah, I think chocolate milk is great because you have with chocolate milk comparison to regular milk, it has a little bit more carbohydrate in it. So it provides more carbohydrate as well as that protein from the milk. So that's a perfect combination for recovery. So you could do a, something like chocolate milk with like a banana on hand, or you can even have like little tubs of maybe Greek yogurt with some side of fruit, something like that. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, and then I'm kind of wrapping things up now, but just the role of the coach. So we discussed lots today, <laughs> um, but in summary, as a coach, it's important to educate ourselves about proper nutrition and applying and demonstrating our knowledge to become that good role model for our athletes. So it's important to recognize possible opportunities, maybe to integrate a registered sports dietitian to further enhance the well-being and performance of your athletes, or just coming up with different um, solutions. Like I know many of you have posed some different things that you have taken on as a coach to help optimize the nutrition of your athletes, which is excellent. So just knowing about all of those different things we discussed today, maybe different steps that we can take. And then what can I specifically do for you? So as a sports dietitian, I provide many different services to meet um, the full potential of these athletes. And it's not just a one-on-one -on -one consultation or group sessions, but it's also nutrition workshops. So with one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling, that's kind of me being able to take an athlete that maybe be more at risk to um, nutrition deficiencies, or maybe they're having a little bit more difficult time with their nutrition. So examples of that could be maybe vegetarian or vegan athletes or athletes that are at risk of low energy availability or they're under fueling, um, things like that. And that's when I'm able to dive into specifics. However, um, that isn't always extremely common. So I love doing group nutrition presentations and you can choose multitude of different topics, things like fueling for daily training, travel nutrition, competition planning, hydration, optimal recovery nutrition, vitamins, minerals, supplements, as well as um, I'm also a dietitian at a grocery store and just even doing a team grocery shopping tour um, can go a really long way just teaching your athletes on like how to read nutrition labels and how to buy cost effective food. And the last one is that nutrition workshop piece. So that's taking that education into something a little bit more interactive. So that's building off of the knowledge provided in nutrition presentations, um, helping athletes make optimal nutrition happen in their daily training environment or away from home. So I love to like get into the kitchen, help them like use a knife and how to use all these different tools, how to cook for themselves and make budget friendly meals. Um, so yeah, those are all of the different types of services that I can provide and can help your team just enhance their nutrition a little bit more and with so that, do you do it yeah sorry do you do the team grocery shopping tour virtually so yeah you I pick do. a quiet time and uh you know this is the stuff to uh here's the stuff that we talked about in the webinars here's the stuff that we talked about avoiding here's the stuff that we could before during after that sort of thing 
Exactly. Yeah. So um, I would either, there's a couple ways I can do it. Either I present um, virtually and have a slideshow of different areas within the grocery store that they would find, put up like things of different nutrition labels, or because I also do work at a grocery store, I can take them along with me and actually walk them through a grocery store virtually and grabbing different products. Or if they had questions about specific products, trying to find them within the grocery store and like walking them through, um, just tying that educational piece to what that food actually looks like in the grocery store. I guess often it's you know, from, from where we are in the NWT, it's, um, you know, it's, if we, you know, it's great, great to get the athlete on side, but if we don't get the parents, the actual shoppers on side, that's, uh, that may be defeating. Exactly. And yeah, and that's why for those sessions too, I really encourage um, parents to attend and like really target, especially if they're the, I guess, the main cookers for their um, children, right? So definitely giving them the education, not just the athletes, because it does start with the parents too. Cool. Perfect. And your and then, contact information is on a slide? No, there is. Yeah, right here. So that is the very end of the presentation. I have my email, my website, my Instagram, um, as well as just contacting, again, Cassidy um, or the Richmond Olympic Oval just for um, my services as well. Um, but yeah, with that, that comes to an end. So I'm um, happy to take any questions that someone may have. Um, that was a lot of information. So <laughs> please ask away if you have any questions. That was great. Thanks so much, Rochelle. Um, Steve or Thorsten, if you're still there, did we have any extra questions we wanted to go into? Or I see that we're also a little bit over time here. So I don't know if we want to save some of this and have some built up excitement for Rochelle's <laughs> next one. Uh, what are your thoughts there, Steve? Hey, Rochelle, can you hear me okay? I can hear you excellent, yes. Okay, great. Well, listen, thanks very much for the presentation. Even I've learned a lot today. I've learned that I'm not eating in the correct way. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, uh, I'd like to say, uh, actually, coming up is the Arctic Winter Games in the Canada Games, so I'm kind of looking forward to uh, working with you leading up to that and, and hopefully get the kids uh, eating well. Uh, something, though, that I'd like to ask you specifically is you, you talked about athletes in general. Um, Myself as a coach, I normally deal with the younger athletes. Um, what would you say is a good age to start speaking to the young athletes about nutrition and healthy eating? Is there an age we should begin from? Or do you think because they're an actually training program, you should begin right away from the word go? Yeah. I, yeah, that's a great question. And I think the earlier, the better. Um, it all just is how you say it to them. You know, like I mentioned like balance plates, but then I was like one gram per blah, 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 all the numbers. Right. So I would never go to a youth athlete and be like, this is how many carbohydrates you need, like to the T, but it might be really great to be like, oh, like I see that you're eating um, a sandwich with like this protein in it like that's great you know that sandwich is carbohydrate and that's what's going to give you energy and kind of breaking it down with more simple um language i yeah. think that definitely giving you with athletes as soon as you can all that nutrition education is going to be fantastic that's great okay so and, and the other thing I, I i do think that we do need to educate coaches more uh, because even myself I, I i can hold my hand very high and say uh, in, I have a table tennis club in England and we have many young athletes, uh, table tennis athletes, and maybe I haven't gone along this route uh, and done the best for the kids in a way, really, I would say. So it's uh, been interesting to listen to what you have to say, so I've really enjoyed it. I thank you very, very much. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I'm glad you guys learned something today. <laughs> Definitely. And thank you, Cassidy. Yeah, and maybe for just for the sake of time for everyone here, if you did have any questions, you have our contact information, please feel free to reach out to myself or to Rochelle or Thorsten or Steve, they can, they can get the questions to the right people and we can, uh, we can discuss anything further or we'll see you guys again in uh, two weeks for the next one. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks Bye. for joining us, everyone. Bye-bye. Nice Rochelle.